Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Rabbi Chaim Richman with Yitzhak Ruve, and today, the sixth day of the month of Tammuz, 5776. It's July 12th, 2016, this week in the land of Israel. This Shabbat, we will be reading Parashat Balak. If you live outside the land of Israel, you'll be reading Parashat Chukat. Well, I have returned. I was away in welcome the United back, States Rabbi. of America. We missed Thank you. you. And I hate to interrupt your your um, your. There's nothing to interrupt. Solo flying of Temple Talk. It was just a lot of endless drivel. Believe me. I hope you had a great time here on Temple Talk without me. That was lonesome. Well, I'm back now. Here we are in the beginning days of the month of Tammuz, which, as everybody knows, is a month that is difficult. It is fraught with um, angst. That's the best word. It is the, the very time during which the 12 spies were doing their thing. They were walking throughout the land. They left the end of Sivan, the 26th to be specific. The end of Sivan came back the eve of the 9th of Av. So the entire month of Tammuz is taken up with this walking, walking through the promised land and all the things that were going on in their heads and the whole twist that they went through, the spin, that they went through, the switch that they went through, and um, coming back with their evil report. So what we emphasize every year during this time, even as a precursor to the three weeks of mourning that begins two Sundays from now on the 24th of July, the, the it's going to be actually the 18th of Tammuz, because the 17th of Tammuz, which is the fast day, falls out on Shabbat this year. What we emphasize even at this point is how the rectification of the sin of the spies is upon us. It's our obligation in every generation to see good things about the land of Israel, to say good things about the land of Israel, and the whole powerful irony of the debacle of Tisha B'Av and the destruction of the temple and everything in its, in its uh, wake all originated from within, from within our nation when the, when the spies did their, did their terrible act of speaking ill against the land of Israel. Speaking, see, speaking of speaking ill, this week's Torah portion here in the land of Israel is the Torah portion of Balak, which features the heathen king Balak and his hired prophet Bilam, who was a very glib and professional uh, cursor. <laughs> <laughs> he was a he was a prophet. He was a prophet who had a lot of power with his mouth and had the ability to curse and to um, define the exact moment of God's anger, so to speak, as the sages tell us. So Balak took Bilam to deliver up a verbal final solution for the people of Israel, because the reality of the Jewish people having come, on, come out of Egypt and finishing their, about to finish their sojourn in the desert and about to enter into the land and the game changer that that would entail and the paradigm shift of, of, of the world that that would f precipitate was too much for the kings of, of Moab. And they decided that we have to deal with this situation and the rest is Sound familiar? taught to us in the Torah portion of Balak. Some of the most amazing lessons in the world are here in the Torah portion of Balak. But first and foremost, Yitzhak, and I did miss you very, very much. And uh, thanks for flying solo in the meantime, those couple of weeks. Um, we're at a point of, of um, visible differentiation in this Torah portion. Actually began in, in the last Torah portion of Chukat. By visible differentiation, I mean the point of the switch when we read about the new generation, the generation mm -hmm. that's going into the land of Israel, because the Book of Numbers, and I was teaching about this extensively uh, in the States, Book of Numbers deals with two generations. It deals firstly with the generation of the desert, which was the great and inimitable generation of knowledge, the generation that received the Torah, but that ultimately failed, and, and that it was decreed against them not to go into the land. After the 10 trials, the 10th trial being, of course, the worst one of all, the one for which there was no, there was no rectification, and that was the sin of the spies. But now, 
um, when, after Miriam passed away in, in Parshat Chukat, and Moshe gathered the entire Edah, the entire congregation um, that we read about last week to bring forth water, that was already the new generation that's going in. And here we're dealing with that generation that's going in, and they're the ones that Bilam is, is up against and looking to stymie on a spiritual level and to stop their their spiritual path of going into the land. And I think first and foremost, what we need to address in this week's um, show is the palpable, tangible, almost unspeakable revolution that is going on all around us regarding the Temple Mount. And you know that there's a concept that the Torah teaches that uh, through difficult situations, through pain, sometimes through the suffering of the righteous, um, brings about a, a remarkable circumstances for the entire nation. And just at the um, towards the end of the time that I was lecturing in America. I heard this horrible news about the, the Ariel family. No relation to our Rabbi Ariel, but yes, a relation to the minister, Uri Ariel, in the, in the government of Israel. The daughter of Rina and Amicha Ariel that was savagely murdered in her bed by an Arab terrorist that really just ripped the country apart. Um, the, I'm thinking about the incredibly selfless I don't know how to describe it other than uh, ultimate holiness. The whole, the whole um, attitude, approach, and and um, um, uh, way of relating that that her mother, that Rina Ariel has has done, is so amazing. It is so indicative of the holy women of this generation. We always talk about how the women of Israel are spiritually more attuned than the men, and how they are how they are much higher, and we talk about the fact that the women of Israel did not participate in the sin of the golden calf, and that the women of Israel did not, uh, were not included in the, in the decree that was made against the generation, uh, you know, um, and the sin of the spies, that they did come into the land, you know, there were a lot of older women that came into the land with Joshua because they were not included in the decree. And we see over and over again the power of women to bring about the redemption. And this woman is so amazing how she has single-handedly literally riveted the nation around the Temple Mount instead of of allowing the tragedy of the murder of her beautiful innocent daughter to be a personal tragedy she really just was totally above you know making it into a, making it into a a personal thing and and insisted from the very beginning on relating everything to the plight of the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. She and her daughter were very dedicated to the Temple Mount. She herself is is very um, very um, motivated activist in the group of, uh, of of women for the Temple Mount. Beautiful photographs that you that you posted on Facebook of the mm -hmm. family together with the daughter and happier times on the Temple Mount. But today, the day of our broadcast. Um, the family had called for the nation of Israel to come and join them on the Temple Mount as a kind of a, a, an extended condolence call because the Shiva is over now and also as a way of, of communicating th what they felt the most important message is for the Jewish people to hear at this time which is that and I think that they said this consistently during to all the people who visited them during the Shiva that the meaning of their daughter's murder and it's the w only way of understanding it and the only way of rectifying it is is the fact that Jewish people have to show more concern about the Temple Mount. Right. At the event this morning, and they called for everyone to come to the Temple Mount with them this morning, and I say over a thousand Jews responded and were there and waited. And there were you buses that were subsidized from all yeah, parts buses of the country. And, and uh, as per usual with, with the way the police run things, there is a lot of standing in the hot sun and waiting, but uh, that's what we did. 
and the family arrived and Rena spoke and uh, she said exactly that that uh, you know they're they're as she put it graphically their daughter was stabbed in the heart but the heart of the nation is the temple mount and that we all have to to rededicate ourselves to the temple mount in order to heal that wound and that there is no house complete and there's no place safe and, and until Hashem's house. until Hashem's house is is at I'm least you, remembered it's, it's and honored. I'm speechless. It's just it's so incredible to see the 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 valor, the integrity, the righteousness of of this generation of of, of a family that can be so totally selfless and so totally dedicated to the Temple Mount, meaning the concept of rebuilding the Holy Temple. That they insisted to themselves that they must take this tragedy and and turn it into a vessel in order for the, for, the, for the people of Israel to pour into that vessel their longing, yearning, aspirations, and commitment to the Temple Mount. And among the, the thousand or so Jews who arrived, many of them had never been up to the Temple Mount before, meaning that this call reached a resonated, lot of people, yes, really and the, resonated. And, and, it was, uh, and the, the media was talking about it for a long time, and this is what I refer to as this tremendous revolution, the fact that there were so many new people that were there, of course, um, she had actually written a very passionate letter to the Prime Minister asking uh, for a very specific request, asking that 250 Jews should be allowed to go together um, at once. And, and the Prime Minister did not answer her letter. Not she compared it to the fact that 250,000 <laughs> right. uh, Muslims were on the Temple Mount at once during right. Ramadan. And, in and, fact, and during Ramadan, the government you know, goes all out to accommodate as many as many Muslims, including bringing from Aza and bringing from and the Interior Ministry this this year actually subsidizes actually subsidizes buses our enemies on the Temple Mount to, and to of course all that at the c at the expense of non-Muslim visits, which right. have to be highly curtailed and and uh, limited so as not to offend the Muslims during their holy month. Right. I just want to add two things. One is that one of the intentions of this morning was to officially among the the people there and by the family to officially rename the Mugrabi gate that the one gate that Jews are allowed to go into and Mugrabi is actually an Arabic word for Western just means the Western gate to rename it after their daughter Hallel which is uh, the name Hallel means praise as in hallelujah praise uh -huh. God so it's a very 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 beautiful name for that gate and God willing that will become the name of the gate and, and she'll be remembered uh, for, for generations because that will be the name of the gate. The other thing I want to mention is that during the Shiva, uh, the seven days of mourning with the family after Halal was murdered, the Prime Minister arrived and sat Shiva. I'm sure, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bold thing. It's a courageous thing for a Prime Minister to do that. Uh, it's very moving to see that the Prime Minister of the nation, you know, will care enough to visit a, a single family um, uh, who's been visited with a tragedy. And like I say, I think it's very bold and it's very courageous. But when it came to their request to make a change in a single day in the status quo, which he so proudly, you know, boasts from every, every, every uh, podium that he can, that Israel keeps the status quo at all costs, he didn't even have the courage to say I can't do it or I can't do it because of this or that. He just didn't answer. What would it have cost? What would it have cost him to call the King of Jordan and say, sorry King, but it's going to be this way for this day. You know, just keep your mouth shut. That's the way it's going to be. I'm going to give him this one request. This one request from this family that lost their 13 year old daughter. You know, are we not all human beings? But he, he didn't have it within him to, to do that. You know, the status quo had to be kept. The big chupar, the big gift that they got was they allowed as many as 30 Jews to go up at a time. Believe me. In the beginning of the morning, but then as the Yeah, but uh, no, uh, we got to go up in, in larger groups. In but but there was the police, despite the fact that everything was coordinated with the police, pathetically disorganized. I don't know if disorganized is the word or just inept in terms of getting people, moving people along and getting them up there. So by the end of the limited hours that we were allowed to go up, they were, 
they were sort of rushing groups, but you had five minutes to go up and then off, and then the next group would go up. Many, many people did not get to go up. Um, and it's a shame because, again, the, the family, the Ariel family, made a specific point to coordinate everything so there should be no conflict, no bad feeling, that the police should be, you know, know in advance how to best accommodate the numbers. And uh, it's just beyond the police's capabilities, I think, to do that. Or unless interest. Or, or interest, or unless, unless, you know unless they're given or orders. Or it's, it's, it's the orders. Orders. I have been getting the impression, Rabbi, even with uh, when there were riots on the, on the Mount two weeks ago, and the police actually w very aggressively were able to get control of the situation and bring Jews up to the Mount in the same morning that there was stone throwing. It was the Prime Minister who, after two days of this, and when you looked at the footage, it was a handful of Arabs that was causing, causing the problem. It was, you know, it's easy. You get a dozen kids, you put them in there with rocks, and they can, you know, caused the entire nation of Israel to shut the gates. And the police, it seemed to me that the police wanted to keep the, the mount open. It seemed to me like I heard that their instructions were, we got everything under control, you know, let's keep bringing Jews up. Prime Minister says no. And that is his knee-jerk reaction to any time there's a, you know, a flinch that the, that the, that the Arabs say, the Muslims say, oh, you know, they, they somebody hiccups and you know, don't let the Jews up, don't let them do this. That's, it's a shame. But the bottom line, Yitzchak, I think is that what we need to tell our listeners is that I think today was a watershed day. I think, I think today was a, yeah, was a, huge a re revolution. By the way, we do have um, beautiful photographs posted on the Temple Institute's Facebook page. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. For our viewers to see, um, get a feeling of how it was. Again, there were members of the government that were there that, of course, were under orders from the Prime Minister not to ascend, so they just spoke to the crowd, the members of the Knesset. Um, I think if we measure it according to the amount of new faces that were there, it's a tremendous success. And just the fact that so many people came and understood what this message is, that we need to show more of, a, of, a, of an interest, of a concern, especially during these days of Thomas in the Temple Mount. Um, just mentioning I'm not able myself at this time to ascend. It's very sad to me, uh, but I personally am, have been banned by the police for some time now, um, since a little bit before Passover because of the wedding that I performed on the Temple Mount. I have not been able to return. I'm blacklisted, I hope. In the very, very near future, I'll be able to report that I'm able to return to the Temple Mount, but that's another subject altogether. and Very upsetting to me not to be there. But um, I guess I'm a felon. I guess oh, I'm nobody very says you're a felon, Rabbi. You just you're a recidivist marriage maker. I don't know what to say. You're always marrying people. It's dangerous. It's dangerous for the stability of the Middle East for a man to put a ring on a woman's finger on the Temple Mount. Very, very dangerous. You spoke about the Prime Minister. Mm. Um, I spoke about, just for a moment, about uh, Bilam and his uh, wicked uh, intentions to curse the people of Israel. I spoke about the spies, and they're traversing the land now and speaking ill. Um, it all comes together, really, with UNESCO. It all comes together with UNESCO because this, that same group, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, that very recently gave us such pronouncements as Rachel's tomb is actually a Muslim site. Um, and of course, the, the tomb of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is only a Muslim site. So they have given us a heads up um, that they are planning on, on, on voting uh, soon on um, the status of the Temple Mount and that they're going to be announcing that the Temple Mount is a Muslim site. That seems only. to be the assumption. Only a Muslim site. Uh, this same body that claims to be a, 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 um, a stalwart uh, friend of the Jewish people and, and um, claims to protect um, world history, and specifically I see in a letter received from their director general's office, Jewish history. They claim to preserve Jewish history. So while the Muslim walk for the past uh, over 20 years has been systematically destroying the remnants of the Holy Temple subterraneously from the Temple Mount, the UNESCO organization has never said a word 
UNESCO organization is responding. This whole thing is based on a request presented by Jordan, who is a member of U the UNESCO committee or something, saying that Israel's in violations, all sorts of violations on the right. Temple Mount, that Israel's destroying um, archaeo 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 archaeological artifacts and destroying the structure of the Al-Aqsa, whatever. Anyway, Jordan, who would already be history if Israel weren't actively helping Jordan to defend itself from, from ISIS and all these other monstrosities, um, doesn't even have the graciousness to, <laughs> to refrain from some, such an such a insidious move as this. And that's what I was thinking, when, by the way, when you were saying, why can't Netanyahu pick up the phone and call Hussein and say, listen, let me have some, <laughs> you know, some Abdallah. Jews on the Temple Mount. What about the water? What about the scientific, uh, scientific uh, assistance? What about the agricultural assistance and the security coordination and all the things that we do to prop up that, what we like to call that fictitious kingdom? But no. And so now, yes, yeah, so Jordan is insisting that UNESCO um, proclaim the Temple Mount to be exclusively a Muslim site. And uh, we're all, we're all um, in a huff about that. A lot of people are in a huff about that. And Netanyahu is furious about that kind of thing. But the irony is, as far as I'm concerned, that whole posture, position, is not born in a vacuum. And, 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 and this is the truth now. The truth is that the, the, the ability for UNESCO to say such an absurd thing that is revisionist history, that flies in the face of, of, of every of everything that denies Jewish history, that is the result, I think, of Prime Minister Netanyahu's policy on the Temple Mount, because when he doesn't allow a Jew to open his mouth and pray, when people are, are arrested and detained and banned from the Temple Mount for being Jews, for, for demonstrating Jewish belief and existence and sovereignty on the Temple Mount, what do you expect? How do you expect the world to react? So he's the one who actually is showing a, a, a certain degree of contempt for the Temple Mount and a disconnect. And so how can, on the one hand, he, he be upset when UNESCO, you know, is going to go and announce that the Temple Mount is exclusively a Muslim site, but at the same time, he himself denies Jews the ability to worship there, to pray there, practically to even be seen there as normal people. This is what's creating this. Just like the sin of the spies, all the destruction comes from within, and we bring it upon ourselves. And this is the time to fix all of it, and that's what's happening. We are starting to fix it, and I think this morning's turnout was evidence that we are starting to fix all of this and to move towards the Holy Temple. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruvain, and with me back in the studio, Rabbi Chaim Richman, back from his speaking engagement tour in America. Today is the sixth day of the month of Tammuz, 5776, 12th of July, 2016, Parashat Balak. We've been talking about the Parashat, we've been talking about uh, what's been happening on the Temple Mount, we've been talking about UNESCO. You know, in this week's Parashat, Rabbi, Bilam, the hired uh, prophet slash gun, hired by Balak to curse Israel, uh, you know, leads a procession of uh, Balak and all these notables of the heathen nation uh, up to a high vantage point when we're able to look over the entire nation of Israel. Hopefully, uh, he believes that if he can sort of capture the whole nation in his vision, then... Uh, he can curse that nation. But what comes out of his mouth? Beautiful, beautiful words of blessing, of praise of the nation Israel. In fact, some of the most beautiful words we have in our liturgy come from Bilam, including Matovu Famous prayer that we Israel. Say every morning. How goodly are your tents, your tents. Oh, Jacob. So, Jacob, your Mishkinotecha, your, your dwelling, dwelling place is Israel. And um, talking earlier about you're talking about the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. Forget the leadership, in quotes, leadership, but the people, you know, showing their 
our true colors and 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 rising up and and the a thousand or and more people who showed up this morning at the Temple Mount to declare our allegiance uh, and love for the place of the house of God. And I can't help but thinking that that, you know, if anybody thought they're going to put the whammy on us and and they were standing overlooking, you know, you pointed out many beautiful pictures were taken this morning at the Temple Mount. And some of those pictures were taken as usual by by members of the walk who always photograph every Jew that goes up and oftentimes they photograph from high vantage points. And they know. post them, and they on, post them on, on very anti-Semitic, uh, very you know, social media very in order to, vicious and in order to incite right. against the Jews and basically in order to curse the Jews. Right. But it's really, you know, it's, you can't well, do I it. See it's what a you're blessing. Doing with yeah, this. That you know, is so it's beautiful. In other words, he stood on a high place and looked down and wanted to curse all the people and end up blessing them and they took some of those beautiful <laughs> aerial photos like from the from the top of the of the Shaharacham in the mercy gate looking down and so yeah they wanted to use it like to incite against the Jews and to say the but settlers it's, it's are beautiful testimony to, to the hundreds of Jews that are going up every Amazing day to the photos. Temple Mount um, and again this you know this concentration cluster handful of the people of Israel um, that I believe are really leading the way toward a complete awakening of the entire nation and you know the the subject of the Temple Mount and the yearning for the Temple Mount and the appreciation of its significance not just for Israel but for the entire world is not just coming from a specific uh, community within Israel anymore. Everybody is right. is, you know, is, and, is and getting attuned everything to Everything here is connected because the reason that there is this initiative now that UNESCO should should uh, claim the Temple Mount as an exclusively Muslim site It's is, a reaction. It's a reaction to the fact that, that there's never been a time in recent living history when there's been such a tremendous increase in interest and dedication to the Temple Mount by all of Israel. And exactly, and it's a reaction. And, in ter and again, it's also connected to the, the total spiritual bankruptcy and actual political bankruptcy of the Netanyahu government in its in its approach to to dealing with it with the, with the Jewish with the phenomena of of, of Jewish uh, revival around the Temple Mount. It, it, you know, there's never been a regime in Israel as um, I think as reactionary and as um, uh, what is that word? Uh, uh, about decrees that are, there's a word I'm thinking of, escapes me. Mm. Uh, there's, never been, there's never been a government as anti-Temple Mount, as anti-Jewish rights on the Temple Mount mm -hmm. um, as this right, one. Right, right. And it's been, it's been tremendously b b backward peddling. It's been, it's been downhill. It's been, we've lost ground as far as, you know, there's little gestures here and there with the police, but basically the Netanyahu government is totally committed to um, to breathing new life into the myth of the status quo. I mean, it's talking about speaking from a high place. Netanyahu, like you said, at every opportunity, he pumps up uh, the um, status quo. He takes it out of his like of his pocket, like, and he puts it up like some sort as, of pedestal, as if, it, as if, it's, as if as it's something to be proud of. Right, like, as if as if it's, it's as somehow if it's an accomplishment. Uh, you know, uh, he always he always talks about that every religion has a freedom to worship and live it's peacefully. It's insane. In Israel. Like he says things from each side of his mouth. It doesn't even make sense. The simple English of what he's saying, or Hebrew, whatever it is that he's saying. He's saying on the one hand that we, you know about Israel's record of, pr of protecting religious rights and how you know by gum will always have make sure that everyone's re religious rights are protected at the same time he's saying that we will never change the status quo but the definition of the status quo is, is no that only rights. Muslims have the right to pray on the Temple Mount like that video that you made that was so difficult to watch like a year ago like where he's going over and over again Muslims Pray on the Temple Mount, non-Muslims visit the Temple Mount. Right. Muslims pray on the Temple Mount, non-Muslims visit on the Temple Mount. That's what he says, and he's very proud of it, but it doesn't make any sense according to everything that he's trying to say because we have no rights. And he's the one that's protected that. And, what, and so how can you be surprised when UNESCO, which is tremendously anti-Israel, anti-Jew, anti-God of Israel, comes along and, and, makes, a st and makes statements like this? Well, they're taking their lead from, from him. 
And it's a shame. It's a shame because he's not a stupid man. <laughs> No, he's not. He's not a stupid man, and in, and in very many, in many ways, ways he's, he's a very strong man. and very in and very many, fearless. Many but ways for he's some a reason, man. he has this weakness, and I think he thinks that like it's this is where he can give them what they want, kind of thing. But he does it at the expense of the Jewish people, the people of God. He does it at the expense of God's will. God wants us to pray in the Temple Mount. What are you gonna do? So that's the thing. It's the wrong place to be. To be. Um, to, to be stupid, uh, accommodating <laughs> to Jordan. It's the wrong. It's the wrong thing. It's 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 giving the very worst possible message that he can possibly give to Jordan and to the world. He's picking the thing which is the heart of everything, which is the the, the very reason why we're here, which is the very purpose of our being here. You know, I, w I happen to be in America over the Fourth of July weekend. It's been many many years since I was in, in America on the Fourth of July. And I actually saw some fireworks. Cool. I didn't go to see them, as if I have something to apologize for. There's nothing wrong with wanting to see some fireworks. It's beautiful, but I happened to see them from the from the uh, outside porch of the place that I was staying in. I saw some fireworks. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about America's history and um, how far it's come in the years, and what it means to be free in America now. Uh, it's a whole different thing. Look, let me let me tell you what I was thinking about. I was thinking about Entebbe. Mm -hmm. So everybody yeah. knows this past 4th of July was the 40th anniversary of Entebbe. And I got to tell you something, Yitzchak, I will never forget that day. Me too. It was I one of the most beautiful... Young. Watching fireworks and Beautiful in days and, of my yeah. life when I was, what, 17? I don't remember. July 4th, 1970... You do the math. July 4th, 1976. Mm -hmm. That was the most remarkable moment of a, of a young Jewish boy's life, to think that Israel could do that. I mean, and then the details that came out, I mean, flying under the radar, and we happened to be the ones that, that had the blueprints for that airport because we designed it, and how they found this car somewhere in, in, in Tel Aviv that was the exact model of Idi Amin's car, but it was the wrong color, <laughs> and how they requisitioned it, and they painted it, and they told the owner he'll get it back, and they, they, then they went and they did this whole, this whole charade of as if he was there, and, 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 and everybody got all, all uh, flustered, and how they went in, and it's just the whole deal is so unbelievable, and of course, two casualties, one, Netanyahu's brother, and the other, a, 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 a woman, I believe her name is Mrs. Dora Block, and yeah. I believe that she she had she, she was had murdered a, she was murdered in the hospital, in the hospital. Right. there are two other people who were caught and cr killed in crossfire on during the uh, uh, rescue but the idea is that that you know for us like you and I are basically in the same in the same That's situation a game changer. You, you, you and I were at the same age we were yeah. in in, a, in very similar situations in our in in the process of our Jewish maturation mm -hmm. and it was like Wow, that's what it means to be a Jew. That's what Israel is capable of doing. No matter where, no matter what, we will go there and rescue even one Jew. It is the most unbelievable thing. And I remember even even now, like editorials about how this was Israel's gift to America on the bicentennial. This was Israel's anniversary gift yeah. that it ga gave to America this this definition of what freedom is. I was thinking about all this as I was watching the fireworks, and I was thinking, uh, frankly, about the fact that in America now, freedom has an entirely different meaning. Mm -hmm. It's for a kid that's maybe even five years old in some states that happens to feel that he's a girl, a boy that happens to feel he's a girl, is, can go into the girls' bathroom, and so on and so on. And all the and all the things that are going on in America, the total breakdown of of, <laughs> of humanity, that's how freedom is now yeah. defined. Whereas Torah defines freedom as the ability to choose rights, and to and to be able to fight our own evil inclination and to do the right thing. And all these trends in America, you know, if you say anything <laughs> about how you how you think it's wrong, if you say anything, you're a hater. You're a hater. <laughs> You're yeah. intolerant. You're intolerant. You are a hater if you dare say that there's anything wrong with any of these trends. And that's what it's come down to. So you watch the fireworks like, wow, what did people fight and die for? And I'm thinking, you know, about 
what it means to be an American, what it means to be an Israeli, and what this process is all about. And the, the heart of everything is what we're supposed to be doing in this world, and we're supposed to be building the Holy Temple, and we're supposed to be bringing the world to an awareness of who Hashem is. And that's something that was accomplished with the Entebbe rescue to some mm -hmm. degree. And those were days, those were days when um, Israel was able to was able to broadcast that message, and I don't know what happened since then. I really don't know. Jeez, now you got me feeling all depressed, <laughs> Rabbi. Listen, I think that in Israel still we we have that ability. We have the ability, but we are constantly beating ourselves over the head, constantly fighting this fifth this fifth column within right. our within our own midst. Just like the verse in Isaiah that, you know, your destroyers come from within you. Just like the sin of the spies. Just like Netanyahu's ambivalence towards the Temple Mount, I think, being the root of, of the UNESCO initiative. If we don't claim the Temple Mount for ourselves, and obviously we don't, even if we go over that same tired mantra for, you know, for, for almost 50 years, the Temple Mount is in our hands. It's obviously not if we don't allow a Jew to mumble a, 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 wor a word. You know, if we arrest a kid, drag a kid off for saying Shema Yisrael, or ban a wonderful person like myself from ascending the Temple Mount because I, after all, I, all I did was supervise a wedding on the Temple Mount. I mean, my goodness, I'm not a criminal, am I? So yeah, the point is, this yeah. is this, <laughs> this is how this whole thing works. And I got to tell you what it reminds me of. Also, I don't remember where I saw this midrash. It's one of the most amazing teachings. And the idea basically is that, you know, they kept going to a different place and a different vantage point. Maybe from here you'll see them, from here you'll see them, from here it'll be favorable in God's eyes to curse them. And they never could see the whole nation, just the edge, which basically to me means that you'll never really understand them. You'll never really get who they are, but you can, you're just looking from outside. But mm -hmm. anyway, the Midrash says that uh, one said to the other, you know, like Balak said to Bilam, oh, from here they can also see us. They can also see us. And they're going to know that you're cursing them. So it's great because, like, they'll be all upset because they can see us. And then he responded, but they, but they can't hear us. They don't know what we're saying. And then he said back to him, it doesn't matter. Just as long as they see us. They, they'll assume the worst and like <laughs> they're like as long as they see us that we're here like they'll already like be crestfallen and like oh mm. what are the goyim saying what do they say Woody Allen really <gasps> what are the goyim saying what are they saying uh, I thought you were going to say the opposite that uh, you know so many times you can hear great words of praise from from various world leaders you know about Israel and we're their best friend and we've got their back and uh, blah 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 but you know, when you parse the words, you, it's that blessing is is really nothing okay, more than a curse. That actually is it is also true. I'm gonna I'm, I'll, get, I'll now I'll see you and raise you. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll follow up with that. So, the, but I'm saying wh the first thing I want to say is this is a, tr a tremendously deep psychological um, insight. I think that our sages are are alluding to as usual in the, in their incredible vehicle of the of the midrashic teachings. They're saying like, you know, we're so concerned about what people are saying. Right that we're going to go into a tailspin. <gasps> what do they say, right? <clears throat> but what you just said is even deeper because there's a very famous teaching that our sages tell us that, okay, like you started saying at the beginning of this, of this half, like, these are some of the most beautiful blessings that we have. These are some of those beautiful parts of our liturgy. Matovu mm Alech -hmm. Yaakov. It became part of the daily siddur, the daily prayer book. These beautiful utterings of, of all people, Bilam, whose heart actually was black and wicked and, crook and crooked and he wanted to... He wanted to destroy us, and instead God turned it into a blessing, right? But the sages tell us that from his words, you can tell what he really wanted to say. Mm. And this is exactly the idea that you were just saying. Like, you got these world leaders, they say all these unbelievable things, how, oh, I'll move the embassy to Jerusalem. You know, where they say, you know, we're totally, um, in, you know, like uh, Israel's best friend, and, is, and, and Israel's security and concern is our first concern and all this kind of thing. Well, from his words, you can tell what he really wanted to say. So when he said, for example, how goodly are your tents, Israel, your dwelling places, and this is a reference to the synagogues, right? That, that's why we say, as, as the first sentence of the morning yeah. service, we say this line, basically, 
look, read this as a swastika daubed on the door of the synagogue like you see in the newspaper every every week. That's basically what he meant. He meant like <laughs> various synagogues. That's basically what he meant. And it's the same deal now with all these leaders who who purport to be our best friends. As soon as they're they have the opportunity, they turn on Israel. Yeah. So and it's all in this week's Torah portion. concern for us. You know, we should give up land. We should compromise our security. We should give up our heritage. And, and give up our destiny for our own sakes. We're only doing it for us. So on and on it goes, and uh, nothing really changes. And I think that, that there's a lot of um, um, patterns, repeating patterns that we that we see in in this week's Torah portion. I'm going to try to go into that on a deeper level in this week's. If we um, Torah, Torah teaching and our video teaching, if we move along in this week's parsha, after all his words of praise slash curse failed, the the next uh, the next tact was to entice Israel with decadence, and if decadence isn't a an appropriate <laughs> word, you know, a relevant word for for modern society today, then I don't know what is. I mean, that is really you know, the big snare, decadence. And as I think you were hinting at before, freedom has devolved into decadence. And, and I think that's a historical better, process. If you'll pardon me, a more specific word, promiscuity. And that is what freedom means for so many people. And that is not a Jewish value or a Jewish attribute. And that's why at the end of this week's Torah portion, they tried to, in, they tried to foist and, it Yeah, and upon basically Israel. it's not freedom, it's enslavement is, is what it amounts to. You know, it looks like freedom. Um, it looks, you know, like why not everybody's doing it, you know, as long as consenting adults, nobody's going to be hurt. But that is enslavement, and that is the end of freedom. And uh, don't believe it when they tell you that... Uh, What's what's the line? You know, um, lose your lose your inhibition. Uh, follow follow your own. Follow your own ambition. Yeah, that sounds good. That's a nice catchphrase, but uh, that's the beginning of the end of freedom. And uh, freedom, as far as we're concerned, is is ultimately is the freedom to be able to go up to the house of God and to worship God in the place that he chose for us and we started our show today with that subject and I think it's an appropriate place to close because that really is the cry that is being raised here in the land and you're going to hear it more and more and you're going to hear it from more and more people and the government of Israel is going to have to address it and, and the nations of the world are going to have to address it and uh, if they dare think that they can you know, pull another, uh, pull another bilam on us, and uh, say one thing and mean the net, mean the, mean something quite, quite contrary to that. It's not going to happen again, as uh, the who used to say. We're not, we won't be fooled again. Um, we know what we want, and as the Ariel family said today so emphatically and passionately, that our own homes will not be safe, and our own personal worlds will not be complete until God's house is is complete and that is the only guarantee of our safety the only guarantee of peace in the world and it's not just a message to the nation of Israel but it is a message that the world is waiting for us to to say and it's so so beautifully put by these very very righteous people it's like I want to give a little heads up to our our listeners that um God willing, in um, the month of November, actually November 10th to the 13th, we're going to be hosting a temple research conference in the state of Texas. So stay, tu stay tuned. We're going to have a three-day West Texas temple research conference. And it's going to be over November 10th to 13th. Say that five times it's fast. going to be some very amazing and exclusive um, information presented. It's going to be a beautiful time uh, to get together. So I'm going to be providing the details as we get a little closer to the time. That's what the rabbi says. You know what he really means? He really means that you're going to have Yitzchak here on Temple Talk all by himself for a couple also of weeks. True. Also Whoa. true. So there's a double whammy to look forward to. 
in the month of November. It's very exciting, Rabbi. It must be the first uh, of its kind, a West the Texas. The first annual West Texas <laughs> Temple Research Conference. So um, And barbecue, I hope. This is an early bird special. Mark it in your calendar. You're not going to want to miss it. Absolutely not. Well, Rabbi, it's been a thrill having you back in the studio today. Thanks for having me. It's and I hope you'll stick around for a while between now and November. Well, I hope so. I do hope to get up to the Temple Mount, though. Yes, that's a must. Everybody, I want everybody to write emails. Send your emails to Rabbi Richmond. We want you back in the Temple Mount. No, send them to the Prime Minister. Send or to them to the, the Police Prime Commissioner. Minister. He'll respond for sure. Well, there's the music. Thank you very much for being with us on Temple Talk. We will be back, God willing, the both of us, next week, Temple Talk. Mm-hmm.